timing our history. How trace elements analysis will help to understand the past of our planet. Detlev Gunther, ETH, Zurich. On November 9th, I watch TV. I guess football. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. And I can tell you exactly what I did 20 years ago on the 9th of November behind the wall. There is some truth in the sentence, never predict the future, because I can ensure you, even in my wildest dreams, I would have not dreamed to be here with you today celebrating the 20th anniversary of the falling wall. The falling wall opened some opportunities for me uh, to develop, and I took some of them, and some I would like to share today with you about tracermans and the understanding of the past. For the next 15 minutes, I would like to give you some of our first little in snapshot introduction, and I will focus on three applications where we believe, actually, that some breakthroughs can be achieved, which is related to some um, ore formation, climate studies, and, of course, fingerprinting of some old uh, gold objects. Now, analytical chemistry in the field I'm doing research in is related to the detection of elements to its traces. This cannot be a single research area. It's embedded in all the other uh, research areas. And we have the smallest link, actually, in terms of elements and trace elements, because we all know that those elements play a major role in synthesizing new materials and discovering processes from the Earth. The interest, and our main interest, is related to instrumentation and method developments, which we can apply to reveal stories from the past. And then, of course, we generate some new understanding, which is forcing us to develop further techniques. And this circle gets smaller and smaller. Our challenge today is based on physical techniques, which allow us to look from the micro scale further down into the nano scale. And the challenge for us is actually that the sample mass we can analyze is getting smaller and smaller, and we are related somewhere close to 10 to minus 15 gram. And that's related to the spatial resolution because we don't want to look into micrometer anymore. We would like to look into uh, nanometer. The technique we've been working on over the last couple of years, and which we pushed in the direction that we can gain more information, is shown schematically here. We use an intense laser source to ablate a lot of material. You can follow that here, down here. And then we transport material. We excite it under a hot temp uh, temperature, 7,000 Kelvin. And these tiny particles tell us some stories. Now, I don't want to take you back to a chemistry lesson, but if you look into this, you all know this, our periodic table. And our future break will be that all the elements should shine in yellow because that's the detection limits we would need to reveal more stories. So far, we have uh, driven it in the direction that we can reconstruct some environmental pollution and ore formation processes. We can follow the production of new materials, and we can look into some archives from the past. And that's what we have been interested in. And I can extend, could extend this list. Uh, to uh, further topics. However, I want to concentrate on three distinct little stories. Or exploration from the past. Let's make a little scenario. And let's assume nature would not do us a favor in enriching some of the elements we are most, most interested in. Let's assume we would have to dig out our copper and gold and all the precious metals from normal soil. That would cause us some trouble because our landscape would look like this. I can ensure you that ETH and the University of Zurich would not be influenced because we survived down here. However, nature has done us a favor in doing it. But we want to study how much do we get out of this earth for our um, industrial purposes. What you see here is a um, copper ore deposit in Argentina. And of course, it's very important to study how much of the ore is located in here. This is pretty visible. You can see that gold is enriched, enriched from magmatic fluid, which was pressed through the quartz. However, nature also left us some remains, micro-inclusions, in these uh, quartz materials, which we can study in detail if we can drill it out properly and if we can analyze these little uh, inclusions. They contain the original composition of the magmatic fluid 
which formed this ore body. Now we developed these kind of techniques. You can see here these signals which will be, can be generated in tiny amounts, which is parts per billion of uh, gold we have to detect to make a mass balance. These little holes indicate that we drill these inclusions out successfully. And what we found is that a 20 micron inclusion, which consists of picoliter, contains the entire information of the mass balance of an ore body. And we could figure out that 10,000 uh, kilogram of copper are related to one kilogram of gold. The two locations we analyzed are from Indonesia and from Argentina, and they all have the same source of the magmatic fluid. Coming to the second story, climate reconstruction. If you look at this schematic, everything which goes into the ocean floor is compacted there and remains there. And it's the perfect time scale because what you see is over time, everything gets deposited here. Now, in case of rivers, they transport very, a lot of sediments if there is a high water flow or low sediment flows if there is a dry period. If we can analyze from the ocean floor some of these uh, sediments with high spatial resolution, we might trace back um, climate information over thousands of years. Now, our studies being in the Caribbean and we've been uh, participating with a colleague here at Hauk on the ocean drilling program. So we get some um, sediments, ocean sedi sediments, which we try to analyze. That's the process you can see drilling out those sediments, and that's finally the sample we end up. Our aim was to use um, these kind of sediments to look into the Maya society development. In particular, we had some indications that uh, they suffered from uh, not having rain consistently, and they had a very highly developed uh, water system. The sediment you've seen here have been analyzed for some tracers, and titanium is one of these elements which indicate low, there is a dry season, and wet is a, um, it's in high um, titanium concentration. This being the resolution, which has been roughly 10 years ago, uh, possible to achieve, and we wanted to look a little bit deeper into um, these sediments and use an, another technique, microfluorescence, which allows us actually to gain 40 micron resolution, so it means even to a month's record we could come over the last 2,000 years. Of course, you don't get this instrumentation right from a shelf. They have been uh, developed in, in our group, and then we started to analyze it. And I just want to summarize it briefly. That's what I showed you 10 years ago. We can reveal the structure down to micrometer scale and even further. And what we found is that exactly at the collapse of the Maya society, which you see here at the three stages, we can find some negative titanium concentration, which are indicator that this uh, society suffered, here blown up, suffered from periods where they had not enough rain. Of course, if you come with an analytical result based on trace element, which is not a direct evidence, then we have to accept that it's only one possibility. And I can show you there are some other possibilities involved in the collapse of the Mayas. In my last example, I would like to show you, and that can be not only used for provenance studies, I can show you what we are doing with modern materials in the same way as with old materials. We try to get fingerprints of our um, samples to determine the origin, to determine it's real or a fake, or old or new. In one of the studies where we look into the Inca gold uh, objects, you can see here the map of Peru, and these are all little um, ore mines where gold uh, has been taken off the earth and then processed into objects, which you can see here. And of course, the question is where these uh, materials are coming from, and are these objects all belonging to this area? That's part of our studies, and I just show you one case study from an uh, Inca gold collection from the Ebnudur uh, collection in Switzerland. And if you analyze this ornament consisting of three pieces, you can see that the first part, the suspension ring, looks slightly different. 
It's also in the major element composition slightly different. However, if we study the traces and look into some indications which elements have been used in the, in the uh, production of these materials, we can distinguish them um, very well. That's what we would like to do in the future to really set up an origin. Can we trace back the uh, materials to its original source? That brings me towards uh, the future. Where are we going to? I told you that we are developing techniques um, according to the needs towards smaller and smaller materials. However, if you have to place or put your samples always under vacuum or in certain cells, then you put a damage on these samples. So we don't get it. And therefore, we've been looking for almost five to 10 years uh, into a possibility where we can do this sampling under atmosphere without using any prerequisites. And we could not envision that one day it would be possible that we have just something like a very, very little vacuum cleaner which allows us to suck in this material in form of nanoparticles. We analyze it and we get this information within a very short period of time, something like 30 seconds. That will help us, and I hope that will help us to develop further techniques for trace elements in the future. One of the archives already waiting for it, you can see here, it's a stalagmite and we don't have to cut them in the future anymore. We can really analyze them as pieces as they come sometimes one and a half or two meter long. That will be work in the future. And it, let me uh, summarize the presentation a little bit in a way what we are looking for. In the future, we hope that we get a little bit more sensitivity and improved limits of detection. We would like to have better high spatial resolution and understanding, generating understanding of the role of trace elements. We are not a single research area and single research groups. We're working in a highly interdisciplinary field, and I simply think there are some walls in between we have to break down to co collaborate even further. And of course, the best way, ladies and gentlemen, is never build a wall. If I'm allowed to come here, I would like to thank my research group sharing my enthusiasm for this field. And of course, this research also needs a lot of sponsors. And in particular, I'd like to thank my coll uh, colleagues at ETH who are already in the approach of setting up a very interdisciplinary research. With that, I thank you very much for your attention.